I recently saw a tweet storm by entrepreneur slash investor slash philosopher Naval Ravikant. He was challenging people to meditate 60 minutes a day for 60 consecutive days. Here's a quote from Naval about his meditation challenge from the Naval Almanac. Meditation isn't hard. All you have to do is sit there and do nothing. Just sit down, close your eyes and say, I'm just going to give myself a break for an hour. This is my hour off from life. This is the hour I'm not going to do anything. If thoughts come, thoughts come. I'm not going to fight them. I'm not going to embrace them. I'm not going to think harder about them. I'm not going to reject them. I'm just going to sit here for an hour with my eyes closed and I'm going to do nothing. An hour a day of doing nothing. I thought, that's crazy. So I did it. It changed the way I think about productivity. This is Love Your Work and I'm David Cadavy. Giving up an hour a day for two months seemed impossible, but I knew if I didn't at least try it, I'd be a hypocrite. I had just finished writing a book called Mind Management, not Time Management after all. Taking on this challenge meant I'd be giving up an hour a day in the midst of launching a new book, which is always a busy time. But it also looked like the best possible test of my belief that time management is dead. I'd give up an hour a day of doing to just sit. I'd place less emphasis on time and more emphasis on my mind. Here's how it went. The first couple weeks were the strangest. My mind was blank. I felt numb. I lost all motivation, but probably not in the way you think. Usually when people say they've lost motivation, they feel bad about it. They feel they should be motivated, but they are not. Instead, I lost motivation in a good way. I didn't feel bad about my loss of motivation. I didn't think, oh no, I want to do things but can't find the motivation. But I sensed my brain needed to discover new routes to motivation. What would that be like? I wanted to find out, so I kept going. My lack of motivation didn't manifest itself as a lack of motivation to do things I otherwise wanted to get done. Instead, when I thought of something I might do, I'd say to myself, nah, that's not important. I've long been a practitioner of getting things done, which I summarized on episode 242. One of the keys to making GTD work is to write down everything you think of doing. Big, small, unimportant, important, even things you might do someday, maybe. After you write something down, you either do it, delegate it, or defer it. Thanks to meditation, I discovered a fourth option. Forget it. In other words, don't even write it down. Just let the thought pass. This is easier said than done. GTD works because it closes open loops in your mind. If you don't write the thing down, GTD wisdom states, you'll keep thinking about it. By meditating an hour a day, suddenly I was able to think of something I might do, decide it was unimportant, then forget about it completely. But as I decided not to do the things I would otherwise do, the things I wasn't going to do started bubbling to the surface. Setting aside an hour a day where I couldn't do anything but let thoughts flow had two effects. One, it reduced the time I had to do the things I intended to do. Two, it increased the time I had to think about things I would do if only I had the time. These effects had a symbiotic relationship. I didn't have as much time to do things I intended to do, so I had to be more efficient with things I did do. And doing begets more doing. Each time you do something, it reminds you of other things you could be doing. The more you do, the more entropy sets in and you make bad decisions. By meditating an hour a day, I had less time to do things and more time to think about how I would do those things once I did them. So the things I did, I did better. It is more productive to delete from the to-do list than to mark done. Setting aside an hour a day also gave me more time to think about things I would do 
if only I had the time. Those crazy ideas you normally let pass through your mind. You say to yourself, I wish. Wouldn't that be nice? That would never work anyway. By thinking more about the crazy ideas I wasn't likely to follow, those ideas started to take on more importance in my mind. As I thought more about these ideas, they started to seem doable. Things like taking a solo retreat to a cabin in the Colombian countryside. I still wasn't sure my crazy ideas were going to work, but I came to a realization about that, too. I realized we're bad at consciously using our attention. Scientists have known this for a long time. Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky coined it the planning fallacy. You see the planning fallacy in action when you try to log into your bank account to pay a bill. You think it's going to take two minutes, but then your password manager malfunctions, then you have to complete three pages of CAPTCHAs, then you have to do two-factor authentication so you grab your phone, but your phone has a text message on it. You know the drill. The planning fallacy compounds as complexity creep takes over, which I talked about on episode 237. This is why fewer than half of students complete their papers in less time than their worst case projection. This is why the Sydney Opera House took 10 years longer and 15 times the budget to build as expected. So if we're bad at using our conscious attention anyway, maybe we shouldn't put much trust in ourselves to use all our conscious attention getting things done. We spend all our waking attention trying to do things. We think, if only we could do all the things we intended to do, we would finally achieve the success we deserve. The things we intend to do don't just take more time than expected. Nassim Taleb demonstrates in The Black Swan, which I summarized on episode 244, we also have no idea whether things we've decided to do are worth doing in the first place. In the extremist world of creative work, our biggest successes often come from trying to do one thing then stumbling upon another. Europeans discovered the new world while searching for a route to India. The microwave was discovered when a radar experiment accidentally melted a chocolate bar. Penicillin was discovered when experimental samples got contaminated. I got my first book deal while trying to land a slot to speak at a conference. As William Goldman said, nobody knows anything. Goldman's not knowing anything didn't keep him from winning two Academy Awards for screenwriting. If great discoveries come at random, what can you do? You have to be doing things that might not work, and you have to be ready when a great idea comes. As Louis Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. To give yourself a chance at making great discoveries, Nassim Taleb recommends the barbell strategy. Invest 85% of your resources on sure bets. Invest the remaining 15% of your resources on wild cards. Those crazy ideas that probably won't lead to anything, but that have unlimited upside. You can learn more about the barbell strategy in my Black Swan book summary on episode 244. Meditating 60 hours in 60 days had more benefits than I could possibly list. I slept better, I had more intense dreams, I became more patient. But here's the biggest thing I learned about productivity meditating 60 hours in 60 days. Meditation is the barbell strategy for your waking attention. If we're no good at using our conscious attention anyway, and if our best discoveries come at random, it makes perfect sense to surrender a portion of your conscious attention to randomness. If you invest one hour of your working day in meditation, you invest 12.5% of your working day in mental serendipity. That's enough time not only to think about the crazy ideas you otherwise wouldn't pursue, but also to think about the great discoveries happening right under your nose. When you're working in extremistan, you have to be wary of results. Big wins are rare and positive black swans take time to grow. In the more than 500 blog posts I've written in the past 16 years, I've had two that led to black swans, one a book deal, the other working with a company that sold to Google. But I did have one big win during my meditation experiment. On the day I launched my new book, I had a winning tweet storm. 
The first tweet in the storm alone has over 100,000 organic impressions. I had over 150,000 impressions in one day. Previously, on a really good day, I might get 25,000 impressions. The end of that tweet storm brought 500 organic clicks directly to my book's Amazon page. This tweet storm took me several hours over the course of weeks to write, edit, and publish. Now, would I ever in a million years have bothered spending that much time on a few tweets? No way. That is a crazy idea. But thanks to my hour a day of meditation, I couldn't let the idea go. I had to do it. Meditating 60 hours in 60 days changed the way I think about productivity. So what did I do once I was done? I meditated the next day and the next day and the day after that. At this point right now, I've meditated an hour a day for more than 80 days in a row. It's a crazy idea, but I think this is just something I do now. One thing I've learned in over a decade as an independent creator is to invest in ideas. They really are everything. Most of them don't work out, but the ones that do can be big. I had one idea that led to a book deal and transformed my life. I had another idea that connected me with a company that later sold to Google, which brought a surprise payday. Big ideas start small, and the place I share my ideas first is my weekly newsletter. It's called Love Mondays, and each week I share a big little idea about how to break through to become a true original and make it as a creator. I also share my favorite quotes and books and tools for thought. Think of Love Mondays as like a shot of creative fuel to start off your week. There's several thousand subscribers. We're having a good time. Join Love Mondays at kdv.co slash newsletter. That's kdv.co slash newsletter. You might have noticed I don't have ads on Love Your Work. I haven't had them for a long time now. In fact, a big company whose name you would definitely recognize offered me money to advertise in this show recently, and I had to turn it down. Why? Because some money feels good, some money feels not as good. When I see that somebody bought one of my books, that feels good. When a company advertises on the show, I mean, it's money, but that doesn't feel quite as good. Another kind of money that feels really good is the money I get from my Patreon supporters. It feels like an honest exchange. It's a vote of confidence that they like the show. Since I myself support a number of creators on Patreon, I know it feels good to vote with my dollars and support the kind of work I would like to see in the world. And that's what I'm trying to do here. Make the kind of podcast I want to listen to and share the ideas I want to see in the world. So if you like the show, a great way to let me know is to support the show on Patreon. Even a few bucks a month helps. It really adds up over all the dedicated listeners and it motivates me to keep doing what I'm doing. If you'd like to support the show, visit the Patreon page at patreon.com slash cadavy. You'll see the different levels and perks available. Even if you're on the fence, check out the page. Again, it's at patreon.com slash cadavy. That's patreon.com slash cadavy. Thanks for your support. Thank you to our newest Patreon supporters. Thank you, Andy, Zaretta Hammond, and Frederic. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our top Patreon supporters, such as Jeffrey Mason. The theme music for Love Your Work is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadaby, Inc. Inc.